We have more sunspots from Solar Cycle 25, an Earth directed solar storm launch, and let's take a closer look at those solar wind switchbacks from Parker Solar Pro. Those stories and more in the news this week. This space weather forecast is sponsored in part by Millersville University. Come get certified in broadcast space weather. Visit millersville.edu slash swen. Space weather this week is definitely starting out the new year with some promise. As we switch to our front side sun, it all started with region 2753. This is a solar cycle 25 sunspot. It occurs at high latitudes, very far away from the magnetic equator. But no sooner than this region rotates off of the Earth-facing disk, than yet another solar cycle 25 sunspot appears. That's region 2755. As we switch to our far side sun, you can see it from stereo's view. This is stereo looking at the sun from the side. Right about the beginning of the year, you see that solar cycle 25 sunspot emerging uh, right about the edge, uh, right in the center of Stereo's view. This region is the second region this, of the new solar cycle that we've seen in just so many days. And even though we do have yet another uh, solar cycle 24 sunspot that has emerged on, in Stereo's view that will be rotating into Earth view, having all these new sunspots emerging so close together means these new regions will start flaring soon, and that means we're going to start having to worry about radio blackouts, not just for amateur radio and emergency communications, but also for radio comms when it comes to rocket launches and other types of space traffic. But wait, there's more. About midday on the 5th, we actually did have an Earth-directed solar storm that was launched. You can see the poof right there about center disk from a region that wasn't even an active region. As a matter of fact, Halo CME posted this online. You can look at the blast radius from that poof kind of expanding outward on the sun, but we weren't exactly sure there was going to be a solar storm that was associated with it. Yet as we turn to our far-sighted monitor, this is stereo and we're looking at the coronagraphs from stereo's view. Sure enough, right there you see that solar storm being launched. It is definitely headed towards Earth. We're going to get better images as time progresses, as the data gets better, and then we just wait for the prediction models to tell us more. Last year, NASA's Parker Solar Probe made records around the world as it flew closer to the sun than any other spacecraft. The probe has now made three of its 24 planned passes through the sun's corona, and scientists are beginning to unravel long-standing mysteries. Four papers published back in December in Nature described early results from the data, but one discovery in particular has everyone in the scientific community talking. It's the discovery of kinks in the magnetic field near the corona at the edges of equatorial coronal holes, thought to be the birthplace of the slow solar wind. These switchbacks, as now they are affectionately called, are created when the sun's magnetic field folds back in on itself, which can only occur because the field is frozen into the charged gas of the solar wind as if glued there by magnetic and electric forces. The reason why these switchbacks are so noteworthy is that they might finally be leading us to understand why the solar corona is so much hotter than any other region of the sun. Considered to be the holy grail of solar atmospheric physics, the coronal heating problem has plagued the physics community since before scientists even knew the solar wind existed. And now finding these switchbacks is like finding the smoking gun that will dramatically change current theories of the solar corona and the solar wind. At the American Geophysical Union meeting back in December, Numerous solar and space physicists gathered to discuss the origin and nature of these switchbacks. As it turns out, near the sun's surface, small fast jets of solar wind can overtake slower ones, thus causing the magnetic field that is glued to these different jets of solar wind to fold back in on themselves and kink, like ribbons or flags kink while flapping in a rapid breeze. But in space, these kinks imply a very specific kind of wave process called alphane waves which have long been postulated as a source of heating of the corona. The long-standing question has always been, well, what would be causing these alphane waves to develop? And now it looks like Parker Solar Probe has found the answer. Impulsive jets from things like spicules, jetlets, or even bright points on and beneath the solar surface may just be the source of coronal heating. But the final word is yet to be written. As Dr. Tim Horbury from Imperial College said at the meeting, quote, the nice thing about the sun is that it has so many possible sources of impulsive events, so clearly we need to work back over the next few years to find out and sample what they are." Unquote. 
Earlier missions to the Sun have only reached as close in as 60 solar radii from the Sun, whereas Parker Solar Probe is now in as close as 30 solar radii. So a second important question is, if these switchbacks are truly the key, then how can they disappear before reaching 60 solar radii away from our star? The answer may lie in how fast these switchbacks die. Indeed, simulations are already showing how these switchbacks have a limited lifetime, heating the solar wind as they die. Dr. Anna Tenorandi from the University of Texas showed such a simulation at AGU, demonstrating how these switchbacks slam into density spikes in the solar wind, which slowly shred them apart, similar to how a wave in a river might shred apart as it comes across boulders in its path. Even the largest of these switchbacks is shown to shred about 40 solar radii out from the sun, which is why Parker Solar Probe is the only spacecraft that has ever observed them. So although we still have so much to learn about these switchbacks and how their associated alphane waves give up energy to the solar corona and the solar wind, no doubt Parker Solar Probe has already enabled a whole new generation of solar exploration. Almost overnight, we find ourselves one step closer to understanding not just about our star and how it creates space weather, but how other stars in the universe emit energy, bathe the universe in life-creating elements of the solar winds, live, and possibly even die. And we can thank the Parker Solar Probe and its team of dedicated scientists for bringing us one step closer to solving the holy grail of solar mysteries. Switching to your solar storm conditions and aurora possibilities over the coming week, we are anticipating that Earth-directed solar storm gets on its way, and along with a small coronal hole that's rotating in through the Earth's strike zone, it's going to be sending us some fast solar wind, just a smidge of it. We are expecting the impact of all of that stuff together to be right around the 8th and into the 9th. At high latitudes, NOAA's expecting active conditions with a possibility of major storm conditions. As a matter of fact, about a 25% chance of a major storm. Now, mid-latitudes, the predictions are a little bit less clear. We are expecting unsettled conditions, although we did hit active conditions earlier today. So we do have a decent chance of active conditions. And then when that solar storm hits, we could easily see a small chance of minor storm conditions at mid-latitudes. Don't know if it's going to give us all that much aurora. If shows happen, they'll probably be fleeting. But hey, it's the first time we've seen an Earth-directed solar storm in quite some time. And then after after that things hit, it'll start kind of settling down as we get through the weekend. Switching to your solar flare and particle radiation storm outlook over the coming week, everything is still in the green when it comes to big solar flares. We don't have any risk for radio blackouts right now, and that should make you GPS users very happy. But hey, look at this. We also don't have a spotless sun anymore. We have region 2755, that is a solar cycle 25 sunspot that is in Earth view right now. And we also have another sunspot that's going to be rotating into Earth view here over the next couple days. And that, both of these are managing to boost the solar flux well into the 70s. We are at the marginal range for radio propagation on Earth's day side, and this is going to continue easily over the next few days, possibly throughout the week. So radio operators, you guys should be very, very happy about this, these conditions, and they are continuing. But we are not through solar minimum yet. We're still dealing with it. As a matter of fact, the cosmic ray penetration is really close to the highest it's ever been right now. So you frequent flyers, and this does include air crew who fly over 800 hours annually and fly at high latitudes and high altitudes, you are still well into the marginal range for radiation dose. And this does include prenatal passengers. So please take this into consideration in your flight plans. So the space weather this week has gotten very exciting. Not only are solar cycle 25 sunspots becoming the norm, but we also now have an Earth-directed solar storm that's launched. When was the last time we had an Earth-directed solar storm? It's wonderful. The sun is actually beginning to wake up, so this is such good news. Now, your aurora photographers at high latitudes, you should be able to get a pretty decent show even in through the weekend. But those at mid-latitudes, well, better stay on your toes because it's going to be a fleeting show. But most likely, you'll be able to see something, if anything, around the 8th and the 9th before things begin to settle down. Now, amateur radio operators and emergency responders, you are 
also very happy. We have bumped back up into the marginal range for radio propagation on Earth's day side, and we are staying there. We are now in the almost the mid 70s, and these conditions will continue easily over the next few days, possibly over the next week or two before things settle back down. Now, the only issue is with you GPS users. Well, your GPS reception on Earth's day side should look really good until about the 8th or the 9th when we get this solar storm heading. And then especially on Earth's night side, you're going to have to stay away from the aurora and away from the dawn dust terminators in order to make sure that your GPS reception remains trustworthy. I'm Tamitha Scove. Thank you for watching.